Raphis replicare, more commonly known as the dodo bird, is quite possibly the dumbest creature I've ever seen in my life. It wanders around the beaches of the island, pecking berries off bushes and being eaten by all manner of carnivore. Without the dodo, the whole island's food chain would disintegrate. This subspecies of the dodo has developed an unbelievably clever way to sustain itself. They mate constantly. I'm fairly convinced that they reach full maturity within a week of being born. This is the only trait keeping them populous on the island. While it can be done, there is almost no reason to domesticate a raphus replicare. It cannot carry enough to be a beast of burden, it does not provide much food, and it's too stupid to show companionship. It could work as a last-ditch food source, though, so I suppose keeping some around for lean times has a certain logic. Dilophosaurus spudatrix is a strange creature. It stands at just over half the size of known Dilophosaurs and runs from aggressors as often as it fights them. Dilophosaurus spudatrix has a few traits not common in the Dilophosaurus genus. It has a very shrill call and a decorative ridge of skin on its neck. I believe these are used to attract mates, as well intimidate prey and would-be predators. Instead of attacking its prey outright, Dilophosaurus spudatrix spits venom to weaken and paralyze it before moving in for the kill. Because of their shrill cry and their ability to attack intruders from range, Dilophosaurus seem most suited as guard dogs. Due to their small size, they are not suitable as mounts. Lystrosaurus amica fidelis is a small herbivore common to much of the island. Only about two feet long, it is not high on the food chain and eats small plant life. The island's poisonous insects seem to have little effect on Lystrosaurus. Despite being among the island's tinier herbivores, Lystrosaurus is an incredibly resilient survivor. It recovers its torpor and health much faster than most creatures, which makes rendering a Lystrosaurus unconscious a rather difficult affair. Not surprisingly, Lystrosaurus is an extremely loyal pet once tamed. It's a very fast learner, so it gains experience much more quickly than most other creatures. Additionally, its presence nearby appears to inspire allies, making them learn more rapidly as well. Thusly, Lystrosaurus is an excellent addition to any tribe's hunting party. Among the most vocal creatures on the island, Ichthyornis piscoquis actually appears to be a relatively normal seagull. It primarily eats fish, and its distinctive cries can be heard echoing over across the island's many beaches. As you might expect from a seagull, Ichthyornis will flee at the slightest provocation. Ichthyornis is a versatile and opportunistic hunter. Its primary form of attack is to dive into the top layers of water and impale its prey. However, since its food source can be unpredictable, Ichthyornis has developed a keen ability to steal food from unsuspecting travellers. Their affinity for shiny objects leads them to sometimes knock tools and weapons out of the hands of unsuspecting survivors. But Ichthyornis is too small to actually fly off with them. Ichthyornis surprised me by being a very loyal and very social creature once tamed. It likes to ride on its owner's shoulder and bring that person treats, in the form of fish, of course, which its beak grip enhances with extra healing vitamins. The personality of Ichthyornis reminds me of a house cat hauling a trophy prey back home, except it brings extra healthy fish instead. The much larger ancestor of water birds like the stork or pelican, Pelagornis myosinus shares many traits with its modern day brethren. However, it seems to spend far more time hunting for fish over the open deep sea. In fact, I have rarely spotted a wild Pelagornis anywhere near the coasts of the main island, as it prefers to rest its wings by paddling on the ocean's surface rather than waddling along the island's beaches. Perhaps this behaviour is a result of its survival instincts. The early Miocene was a post-dinosaur epic after all, and Pelagornis would not be accustomed to such predators. Considering how quickly it flees from humans, one can hardly blame its caution. Because of its ability to fly, walk and surface swim, a tamed Pelagornis is one of the island's most versatile mounts. But this comes at a cost. 
The same webbed feet that allow Pelagornis to serenely manoeuvre along the ocean's surface prevent it from carrying prey off the ground, which may limit its appeal to some survivors. Parasaurolophus amphibio has one of the more interesting adaptations of any creature I've seen on the island. Like all parasaur, it has a signature crest on its head. Very docile at first, I've been able to approach the creature without disturbing it. If startled, however, the creature can vocalise a distress call to the surrounding area that warns of danger. Parasaurolophus appears to be low on the food chain and is hunted by everything, creatures and humans alike which explains its skittish nature. It is a good source of meat and hide, if you can manage to keep up with it long enough to kill it. Despite being what most tribes consider a relatively useless creature to tame, I once met an interesting woman who had tamed an entire herd of them. She informed me that many overlooked the creature's potential. She even graciously gifted me a fancy saddle to put on my own Parasaurolophus one day. As a relatively simple creature to domesticate, Parasaurolophus is commonly one of the first mounts a tribe will be able to acquire. Its ability to run relatively fast for lengthy intervals makes it a solid mode of medium-range transportation, though it has almost no ability to defend itself or its rider in a traditional sense. Smaller creatures, however, appear to be frightened by the horn of Parasaurolophus, although it doesn't do much damage. It also has decent weight-bearing capabilities, which could prove useful for nomadic tribes as they work to establish a presence on the island. Fiomia ignavis is another of the island's generally docile herd animals. They are small enough that almost any predator can bring them down, but large enough to provide plenty of meat. Were it not for the protection of the herd and their instinct to run from any predator, these would almost certainly be hunted to extinction Fiomia's tusks and trunk make it especially suited to scavenging plant life from the ground. It uses its tusks to dig up loose plant life, then uses its stubby trunk to scoop the foliage into its mouth. Adult Fiomia often dig up food for their young, and watching a baby Fiomia attempt to use its trunk can be quite amusing. While it is completely possible to ride a Fiomia around, they are a meagre choice. They work very well, however, as pack mules. If you feed the Fiomia a stimberry, it serves as a laxative in the creature's digestive system. Knowing this, tribal communities often keep a herd of these as livestock to produce mass quantities of fertilizer. Carbonemis obibimus is one of the least aggressive creatures on the island. Were it not for the plethora of predators on the island, I'm quite certain that it would spend its days basking in the sun, eating or sleeping. Carbonemis leads a simple, solitary life. Nevertheless, it seems to be one of the most peaceful animals I've yet encountered. With its slow walking speed, the only things that keep it safe are its surprisingly fast swim speed and its incredibly thick shell, which can absorb tremendous damage. Carbonemis' swift swim rate, fairly high strength, superior shell defences and lack of real threat makes it an ideal armoured mount for many survivors who shy away from violence. It can carry its rider to the ocean's resources at fairly high speed, and it's not particularly dangerous to tame. Like most trilobites, Trilobite conchodurus is an opportunistic carnivore that feeds on anything smaller than itself which it can get a hold of. A sluggish creature, the trilobite's best defence is its incredibly hard shell. This seems to be a common adaptation for the slower creatures of the island. Trilobite is not a very good source of food. The creature seems to be made mostly out of internal organs and its protective carapace. This is good for the trilobite, as both river and ocean predators are less likely to prey on it if there are better options around. The trilobite does not seem to have enough intelligence to be tamed, this doesn't mean it has no use among resourceful survivors, however. Found along beaches and in the ocean's shallows, trilobites are easily one of the best sources of oil, pearl and chitin on the island. Presuming one doesn't wish to venture into the dangerous caves, 